Good evening, dear friends. Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. Wonderful to be with you all. Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge once again. First of all, I bring you greetings from Calvary Chapel in Jerusalem and Calvary Chapel in Otley, England, where my family worship, despite my New York accent. My family are Israeli and we live mainly in England. To understand Israelis, to understand the Jew today, let's read the book of Ruth, beginning in chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, which means, my God is king. And the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Machlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and returned there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Machlon and Chilion also died, and the woman was, be woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. For it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death separates you from me. And when she saw this, that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. The Jews returned to the land, bereft. My wife's parents were Holocaust survivors, but most of the family weren't. When my wife was a little girl, she was brought up to be told that the gospel of Jesus Christ was Jewish children being put into an oven. That was the gospel. You ask my wife's mother, what's the gospel? She'll tell you. It was the Christians, you know, the Nazis, who killed us. That's what they think the gospel is. Now, my wife, of course, became a believer in Yeshua, in Jesus. And my children who were born in Galilee now witness to their Holocaust surviving grandparents telling them about Yeshua. But is this idea, God is against us. God has done this to us. And in some sad way, they're right. The curse of the law, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and what Moses said, I will raise up a prophet among your people. And he who rejects him, I will require it of him. Deuteronomy 18:18. 18, 18. By rejecting the Messiah, Yeshua, the Jewish people remain under the curse of a law they cannot keep. In some sense, they are right. God's hand is against them, but not in the way they think. Now a Moabite then would have been almost like what a German is now. That would have been the kind of animosity they had because of what the Moabites had previously done to them. Ruth was not only a Gentile, but a Moabitess, the worst kind of Gentile, and they're thinking. They come back to the land bereft. I once knew a man named Gershom, German Jew. For 40 years, that man had no emotion. The Nazis killed his wife, his five children, his parents, all of his brothers, and all of his sisters. That man went around 
for 40 years, tormented day and night. He was beyond the point of grief. He didn't have the capacity for that anymore. He was almost like a machine. Until the day he came to hear about a Jew who suffered more than he did. And he began crying, how could anybody be nailed to a cross for my sin? And he began crying and he accepted Jesus. It was the first emotion that man had shown in more than 40 years before he died. That is the Jewish sense, the Jewish heart that you see in Israel. First the Holocaust, then the communists with the refuseniks, and now in our own land we have no peace and the world is biased against us. But then there's two women. Every non-Jew, every so-called Christian, and every Christian church will either be in the character of Orpah or Ruth. Orpah will go back to her own gods. Why is it that people in Venezuela, people in the Philippines, people in Nigeria worship the Jewish God? As Isaiah prophesied in chapter 11, Ishayahu Hanavi, the nations, the Gentiles, will resort to the Shortish Ishai, the root of Jesse, which begins in this book. They came to believe in a Jewish God. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Will you go? I will go. As Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 12, he tells them the following. Paul writing to them is writing about the relationship between non-Jews in the body of Christ and the Jewish people. And he says this in verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from the Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, Hamashiach Yeshua, you who were formerly far off, have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. The new covenant was never made with the church. The Hebrew prophet Jeremiah tells us in chapter 31, verse 31, Yermiyahu Hanavi, Ani yetok brit ha-dasha in bet Yisrael, kam bet Yehuda, lo kamoha brit shini takti imavotchem. I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the one I made with their fathers. The new covenant was made with the Jews, not the church. God never made a covenant with the church, he made it with Israel. Non-Jews are grafted in by faith to the olive tree. Jews who reject Jesus are cut off from their own tree and replaced by Gentiles who accept him. But the new covenant was promised to Israel and made with Israel. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Will you go? I will go. The prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the prophetic purposes of God for the church are inextricably bound up. The return of Jesus depends on the prophetic destiny of the believing church and of Israel. And that's what we see happening today. Every church will be an Orpa or a Ruth. Fortunately, most Calvary chapels are in the character of Ruth. Fortunately, most. But let's continue. So they both went, in verse 19, until they came to Bethlehem, which means the house of bread in Hebrew. And it came about when they'd come to Bethlehem that all the city was stirred because of them. And the one woman said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. Now you have to understand Mara, as we get the girl's name Mary or Miriam, means bitterness. Comes from the word Mara, bitter, like the waters of bitterness in the book of Exodus chapter 15. This idea that God is against us. The Lord has dealt bitterly with us. First the Holocaust, then the Inquisition, then the pogroms, and then the communists, and now we're in our own land, and now the Muslim terrorists. God is against us. That is the sense. God has dealt bitterly. You know, in Israel, there's not one family that hasn't suffered a casualty in a war somewhere along the line. In the Yom Kippur War, the average was one, fam one casualty per family in 1973. I went back, I went out filled, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why did you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and with her, Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Boaz was also the name of one of the pillars of the temple. In Hebrew, it means in his strength. In his strength. 
And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, for one in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And when she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech, now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Adonai Yavarechecha. Then Boaz said to his servant, Who is in charge of the reapers? Whose young woman is this? And the servant in charge of the reapers answered and said, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me, for I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, All that you've done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father, your mother, in the land of your birth and came to a people you did not know previously. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me, and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. And at mealtime Boaz said to her, Come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat next to the reapers, and he served her roasted grain. And she ate and was satiated, and had some left. And when she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servant, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. And also you shall purposely pull out for her some of the grain from the bundles and leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had got gleaned and it was barley and ephah of barley. And she took it and went up into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she also took it and gave Naomi what she had. After that she was satiated. And her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I worked today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and the dead. And again Naomi said to her, The man is our close relative, one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, Furthermore, he said to me, You should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids, lest others fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Not only will God bless those who, God will not only curse those who curse the Jews, but he will bless those who bless the Jews. Believe me, the judgment of God would have fallen on the United States a long time ago due to the genocidal atrocity of abortion alone. There are basically two reasons God's judgment has not already fallen on this country long before September 11th. One reason is it still sends the most missionaries and the most gospel to the most countries. Where is your pastor now? He's in the mission field. That's one reason God's judgment has not fallen on this country with a backslidden church. The second reason is he will bless those who bless Israel. As I pointed out the last time I was here at Calvary with you, God does not love Jews any more than he loves anyone else. But as a nation and a people, he has a special love for the sake of his promise to Abraham. And of course, by coming to faith in the seed of Abraham, the Messiah, you become the same as they are. Your people shall be my people. Notice what Boaz says. Don't touch her. Leave her alone. She's as good as you are. Treat her the same. And Paul says the same thing in Galatians. There is no such thing as a second-rate believer on the basis of race. Jews are the natural branches, but if you're grafted in, you're as much a branch of the same tree as the Jews are. I've commanded them not to touch you. There were people in the early church trying to touch Gentiles, trying to force them to undergo halakhic circumcision to convert to Judaism. 
before they believed in, could believe in Jesus. Paul said, no, don't touch them. Don't touch them. If you have faith in the Jewish Messiah, if you have faith in the seed of Abraham, you're as much a descendant of Abraham by faith as any Jew, and you're as much a branch of that same tree. And God will also bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you because you have been drafted in. There is no such thing as a second-rate believer on the basis of race. It's always on the basis of faith. I've commanded them not to touch you. But why have you shown me favor, asked Ruth? Because you were kind to my people. You see, Jews know the difference. There was a rally in London recently with 55,000 people. Nearly half of them were born-again Christians standing for Israel in the face of militant Islam in Britain. Holding signs, we are Christians who love Israel. And the Jewish people were so moved seeing that. Why are they doing this? We thought Christians hated us. They know the difference. They know the difference between a real Christian and a false Christian. King Christian of Denmark, when the Nazis decreed, when they invaded his country, the Gestapo said, every Jew had to wear a yellow star, so the king came out with a yellow star. And he said, Jesus Christ was a Jew, and every true Christian will wear a star. And the Gestapo didn't know who to arrest. Why? Jews know that. You walk along the court of the righteous Gentiles at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, you'll see trees to families like Cory Ten Boom and many others. Jews know that. They know that. They know. What you say to a Jew with your life is as important as what you say with your words. Now, unfortunately, there are some people only trying to bless the Jews with their social deeds. Unfortunately, the Calvary Chapel in Jerusalem was unjustly, unjustly attacked for witnessing to Jewish people by another organization who said they were building bridges for peace. You shouldn't give Jews the gospel, only give them humanitarian aid. But the Calvary Chapel said, no, we give them both, humanitarian aid and we give them the gospel of Yeshua. Praise God for that. But let's continue. I commanded them not to touch you. I will bless them that bless thee. Curse them that curse thee. And you blessed my people. Now I will bless you. But to understand what's happening here, you have to understand the Torah. You had a provision for poor people. People who were disenfranchised or impoverished. One was you could not harvest the corners of your field. Ruth would have been gleaning at the corners of the field that the Torah said couldn't be harvested. That was for the poor people. It was like a form of social welfare. But Boaz says, no, 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 don't just eat that, don't just glean there, come in and harvest with the rest. You become partakers of everything the Jews have through faith in the Jewish Messiah. But then the second was called Leverite marriage. Leverite marriage is the way we account in part for the discrepancies or the apparent discrepancies between Luke's genealogy of Jesus and Matthew's. Leverite marriage is where someone died and his brother would procreate children on his behalf. This was called Leverite marriage. Leverite marriage was to preserve something in Hebrew called Yerusha, inheritance. The apportionment of the land the, that, that was apportioned by Joshua had to stay within the same family. If the family lost it through debt or something like this, it had to be repatriated to the family in the year of Jubilee. It had to stay in the land. And the tribal identities had to be preserved particularly the identities of Judah and of Levi because of the priesthood and the line of David. And so if you died, your brother would procreate children on your behalf. That was, comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapters 5 and chapters 25. That was the only place where birth control was forbidden in the Bible. The only form of birth control they had in the Old Testament was coitus interruptus. That was the only kind they had. And it was only forbidden in one case. The mother right marriage. In other words, you were not to use your brother's widow as a concubine or a sex object. The idea was to make sure she had someone to look after her in her old age. So in mother right marriage, in addition to the gleaning of the corners of the field, your pension or your retirement was your children. It's still like that in most of the third world. When the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother, it goes well beyond parental respect. What it means in Hebrew is the word is kavod, from the word kavod, being heavy for you. In Greek, it's translated honorarium, get money. In other words, the same as your parents were financially responsible for you in your pediatric years, should the need emerge, you are financially responsible for them in their geriatric years. 
And uh, if you aren't, don't expect much longevity yourself. Don't expect to live a long life. Even if the New Testament says that. That's why I gave my children a choice. I said, look, I can put you through law school, I can put you through dental school, I can put you through medical school, or I can put you through the wall. What's it going to be? <laughs> So now we understand provision for the poor, the gleaning and leverite marriage, a surrogate fatherhood. Chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? And now is not Boaz our kinsman, with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows, winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. And it shall be, when he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies. And you shall go down and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. And she said to her, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all her mother-in-law commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. This was a courting ritual. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she said, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask for all my people in the city. Know you are a woman of excellence. And how it is true that I am a close relative, however there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you, as the Lord lives until morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And again he said, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So he, she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. And she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, These six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, Do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And then she said, Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Who is going to be the Leverite husband? Who is going to procreate children on behalf of Naomi? This is the question. This again all comes from the book of Deuteronomy, from for the provisions of the law. What would happen if you did or did not procreate a child on behalf of your dead brother? We read in Deuteronomy 25, when brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out from Israel. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate of the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He's not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders, pull off his sandal, and spit in his face, and shall declare, Thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And in Israel his name shall be called the name, the house of him whose sandal was removed. You have to understand this is messianic typology. It points ahead to the New Testament. Jews had no salvation under the law. They had what we call kapora, as in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. If a Jew had real faith and real repentance, the blood of those animals, especially the Yom Kippur scapegoat, Hasa'ed Ezazel, would make kapora. It would cover the sin of the Jew until the Messiah came and removed them. He was reliant on somebody who would come after him. 
to redeem his name. You understand? That would be Jesus, the Messiah. When a Jew died under the law, he was reliant on somebody who'd be born after him that his name would not be blotted out, that his name would live on from the book of life. Points ahead to the Messiah. We have a curious institution in Jewish culture called Yiddishkeit, known as the Yiddish Mama. When I was a little boy in New York, there was a very silly song I never liked. Que sera, sera. My mother said to me, will I be happy? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. Well, a Yiddish mama, a Jewish mother, would never say, que sera, shmera. She would say, que sera, shmera. Listen, will you be happy? Will you be rich? You marry a stockbroker like your cousin Mark? You move to Long Island? You'll be rich? You'll be happy? That's what she said to me. A Yiddish mama wants her daughter to marry well. And here she treats Ruth like her own daughter. The Jewish woman tells the Gentile woman how to get the Jewish man. How to get the Jewish husband. We're told in Ephesians chapter 5 that the Gentile church is the bride of Christ, the bride of the Messiah. How did Gentiles get the Jewish husband? Jews preach the gospel to them. The Jew tells the Gentile how to get the husband. However, which one is it going to be? He was the second closest, the second most eligible, was Boaz. And there was nothing attractive about him, but Ruth went to him anyway. And of course we know that the Messiah was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He had no form of comeliness that we should look upon him. Well, what happens? How does this wonderful story end? Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by, and he said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who had come back from the land of Moab, has to sell a piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it before those who are sitting here, and before the elders of my people. But you will not redeem it, redeem it. If you will, you will. But if not, tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I'm after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On that day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must acquire Ruth the Moabitess the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. That's the Leverite husband. And the closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself, that you may have my right of redemption. I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the matter of attestation. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, and he removed his sandal. This next guy in line says, well, it's my inheritance and it's my right. It's my blessing. I'm entitled to it. It's the blessing of my fathers. But you've got to take the Gentile woman. The blessing I want the inheritance I want, the land I want, the heritage of my fathers I want, but I don't want nothing to do with that shiksa. <laughs> that Gentile woman was the way of salvation. It is a difficult thing for Jews to come to a Gentile church culturally. That's why they have to see a woman of excellence. One whom Boaz says, take the grain to my people. And he's not even named. He's just the one whose sandal is removed. You see, any Jew who doesn't come to faith in the Messiah, his name is not in the book of life. His name is not even found in the book. That's it. He's out of the picture. His name is blotted out. It's not in the book of life. You've got to come to the bride. 
So Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are my witnesses today. I've bought from the land, hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilton and Machlon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Machlon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased and his inheritance, so that the name of the deceased may not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. Again, a Jew was reliant on somebody after him to redeem his name. Before Christ, they couldn't be saved, if you understand the typology. And all the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel, and may you achieve wealth and Ephrata and become famous in Bethlehem. Like Rachel and Leah. Remember, the groom wanted Rachel first. But he couldn't get Rachel first. He had to take Leah first. After he got Leah, then he got Rachel. First, Leah was the most fruitful, had all the babies. Then Rachel. Jesus comes looking for a Jewish bride. He doesn't get the bride from his own people. He had to get this other bride first. After he falls in love with her, and she has all the babies. She's the most fruitful. Then he gets the bride he came for first. Zechariah chapter 12. They'll look upon me who they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for the only son. And so it is written, all Israel shall be saved. Comes for Israel. Doesn't get Israel first. Gets the other bride. She's the most fruitful. Then he gets Israel. Then in the last days, Israel becomes a fruitful branch. As in Revelation 7... Romans 11, etc. But let's read. Both of whom built the house of Israel, may you achieve wealth in Ephrata and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Pedas, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord shall give you by this woman, the line of Judah, where the Messiah would come from. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. May his name be famous in Bethlehem. A redeemer from Bethlehem? The Hebrew word for redeemer is goel. We say goelenu, our redeemer. The Lord has not left you without a redeemer from Bethlehem today. And his name's going to be famous. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Oved. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Pedas. To Pedas was born Hezron. To Hezron was born Ram, Ram Abinadab. To Abinadab was born Nachshon, Nachshon, Salmon. To Salmon was born Boaz. To Boaz, Obed. And to Obed was born Ishai or Jesse. And to Jesse, David. That is the beginning of Matthew's genealogy, chapter 1 of Matthew. From whom the Messiah would come. A union between Jew and Gentile. You see, Abraham was a Gentile who God converted to Judaism. Because through him all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. He'd be, his seed would be the savior of Jew and Gentile. That is why you see the genealogy of Jesus has to come through a union of Jew and Gentile. Because he'd be the savior of both Jew and Gentile. That's what's happening here. And so you have this despondent Jewish woman who feels rejected, cursed by God. Everybody's against her. Everybody hates her. God himself is my enemy, she thinks. Until a Gentile woman comes along and takes a baby born in Bethlehem who's called the Redeemer, whose name is great, who shall be the restorer of her life. And this Gentile woman takes this little Jewish baby called the Redeemer born in Bethlehem 
And she gives that Jewish baby to Naomi. And in one day, one instant, all of her pain, all of her grief is taken away. Her life, her hope, her purpose, her raison d'etre are restored. When that Gentile woman takes that Redeemer born in Bethlehem and gives it to her. That is in large part what our ministry is about. That's certainly what Calvary Chapel in Jerusalem, which we are one of the sponsors of, is about. And I know that your pastor, Pastor Pulley, has a great heart for the salvation of God's ancient people. Despondent. Feeling rejected. Cursed. God himself is against us. I have no hope. I'm embittered. There's nothing. There's the Holocaust, the Inquisitions, the pogroms. And now in our own land, the whole world's against us. God must be against us. Why didn't he choose somebody else like Fiddler in the Roof? That's the way they think, and who can blame them? <laughs> Only one way to restore it. Only one way to make the difference. It takes the Gentile woman who gives the Jewish baby and then they say, the baby's been born to Naomi. He's a Jewish baby. His name was not Jesus Christ. His name was Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef B. That said it. This is your baby. We're grafted in. This is your baby. It all depended on a Gentile woman. It depended on a Gentile woman. On a Gentile bride who can take that Jewish baby whose name is great and famous in Bethlehem. That baby who is the redeemer from Bethlehem and gives that baby to that Jewish woman. And all of her grief, her loss, her heartbreak, her pain is taken away. It depends on a Gentile woman. That woman, that Gentile woman, is you. God bless.